Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidence. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Joining me for our weekly chat is Rob Larity, our chief investment officer. Uh, I'm recording on Wednesday, October 11th. So usually we do this the day before. This is two days before because I'm in Boston traveling. Um, also, hope you're not getting sick of my voice. Ton of content this week because of the things that are happening in the world. Um, we also have a lot of new listeners um, from some of the interest of the events of this week. We're glad to have you here. If you want to write to me or give me suggestions about the podcast, I read all the emails that come in and I try to answer all of them. My email address is jacob at cognitive.investments. And if you want to do us a solid, uh, please le leave us a rating or a review on Apple or wherever you're listening to this podcast. It takes two seconds of your time, really, really helps us uh, and allows us to keep doing what we're doing without having to charge for the podcast. Um, otherwise, if you have questions, comments about CI's uh, wealth management services, our research and consulting services, anything like that, you have my email address. Um, take care of each other. Hug the people you love. See you out there. All right. In a role reversal, I'm here in Boston. Rob is in Paris. Nobody's in New Orleans. How's it going, Rob? <laughs> I was going to say I'm jealous of you, but uh, I'm, I'm quite happy where I am, so I, c I can't really say that. Yeah, and why, why would you be jealous of me in Boston? I mean, I, it's pretty nice in terms of Boston weather standards, at least so far, so. Well, you get to hang out with all the team. Yeah, but I'm an introvert. I'd, I'd rather hang out by myself in my basketball shorts in my office. You know that. Um, anyway, um, we're going to use this weekly podcast to check in on all the things that have been crowded out by... The Israeli Palestinian war. So we've been pumping content out this week on that. There is more content to come. I promise you on that. And you'll hear from me solo if, if things really get crazy as usual. Um, but we're going to try it's as hard as it is to, to not touch that topic, because there actually is a lot going on in the world, aside from the focus on the Israeli Palestinian conflict. I'd also just throw there's a lot going on in the world that is violent and terrible too. I mean, the Sudanese civil war is at roughly 9,000 people dead. Ethiopia is having maybe another civil war at the Amharas, who know, like if you start looking around the world, like there's a lot of terrible things going on, just, um, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't captured the attention of the world. And I think that's especially true also when we're talking about political developments, macro developments, financial developments, it's very hard to, to stay attuned to what's going on when other things are happening that are sucking up the, um, the oxygen. So we're going to try and, and give you the, what have you been missing while everything else has been, um, has been at the front of the headlines. Um, and in this sense, Rob, I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to, sort of light our way through the dark, but you're, you're the one who's going to help us figure that out. Cause I've had my nose sort of in the weeds of some of these bigger things that are going on. But the first thing we talked about when we were prepping for the podcast this morning was about what's going on with treasury bonds, um, and sort of the sell off there. Um, I, I sent you a, an interview last night that Paul Tudor Jones did. You were a guest. I don't know if you remember this, like 12 months ago or something. You, you asked me if I'd, you said something about Paul Tudor Jones and I said, who's Paul Tudor Jones? And you like face palmed and you were like, I can't believe I actually agreed to work with you, you moron. You need to go figure out who all these people are. Anyway, so I've, I've been doing my homework. I got a little Google alert that he did an interview on CNBC. And the first thing he said was that geopolitical uncertainty was affecting the market. So felt good about that. But he spent the rest of the interview talking about U.S. debt and about how within a year or two, um, you know, U.S. interest on debt was going to be more than I forget exactly. It was had something to do with the military. And he was talking about debt and he was really afraid about debt and the U.S. fiscal situation and how it was a terrible time to own U.S. equities because of the U.S. fiscal situation sort of backing into the Treasury market from that way. So that's my way of setting you up to talk about um, the Treasury bond sell off and how we're thinking about it and specifically how you're thinking about it and maybe why some of the doom and gloom is unwarranted. Well, first of all, Paul Tudor Jones is from New Orleans. I don't know if you realize that. So double shame on you i i could i could tell he was from this i'm not from new orleans i don't know uh, he, he sounded like a southerner not a new orleanian to me but okay yes <laughs> shame taken humble pie acquired um it, it's funny to see uh to see hedge fund managers and especially very famous and um and long-standing ones doing interviews on television because i always say oh i'm talking my book as you know, they talk their book, mm -hmm. but they don't give the disclaimer. Mm -hmm. So um, you always have to take these statements with a grain of salt. Um, and, and also, I think there's a, a tendency amongst that group to overplay some of the doom and gloom stuff, um, in part because 
there's sort of a strand of thinking about you know the world's going to hell in a handbasket and um that's pretty common so with that said i think what i would say uh, uh, tangibly because you've seen this uh not just paul tudor jones this is a meme or a narrative that's starting to emerge especially around the government shutdown talks and all the political uh, uh developments that we've seen in the last few weeks is this notion of you know is the u.s getting out of control is government debt getting out of control are we sort of galloping toward a hyperinflationary scenario and one of the key things that uh, the term that everyone seems to be talking about in the last week or so, at least that I've heard, is term premiums, which is maybe this is too far into the financial media weeds uh, and the Bloomberg terminal kind of stuff. Um, but I've seen more reference to the word term premium in the last week than I've seen in like the last 10 years. Um, and, and basically what that means is, uh, I'll try to explain it as simply as possible, for those uh, listeners who don't know, um, if you think of the bond market and it has different durations going out, there's 10-year bonds, there's five-year treasury bonds, you know, all different lengths. Um, we know what the market expects interest rates to be at any given point in the future. Like what, what the market thinks the Fed rate will be, the overnight rate, two years from now, that's priced into interest rate markets. So you have this curve of interest rates going off into the future. Um, the term premium is simply the difference between what are the actual long-term bonds and the rate that is implied by that curve. So, for example, if the five-year treasury bond is trading at 4% and if you, you know, and, and that is uh, 100 basis points higher than the aggregate of all the short-term interest rates between now and five years from now, then the term premium is 100 basis points. So that's a really wonky explanation, but it's basically like a measure of fear, a measure of how much people want to be compensated for not knowing if five years from now we're going to be, you know, a banana republic and, uh, you know, <laughs> all the unknown unknowns are, are going to jump out of the closet. Um, so that narrative is growing and I, I think it's worth addressing because we do get a lot of calls from clients about this uh, all the time. Um, about the dollar and about uh, fiscal unsus unsustainability. And I guess the only big thing I would point out is if you really look long term, we have so far to go before we see real fear. And you can measure that quantitatively because ironically in the Bloomberg article that was you know, make, telling this narrative, basically saying, oh my God, people are really getting afraid and look at these term premiums. They show a chart of the term premiums and they go back three years and the term premiums on that time frame. oh wow, they've really skyrocketed. Um, they were negative uh, for most of that three-year period. So people were mm -hmm. paying a premium over what the interest rate markets were saying. But if you zoom out and you can actually click ironically on the Bloomberg article itself and bring up the underlying chart and you take the time horizon and extend it out beyond the last three years, we're, we're barely even getting going. So right now the term premium on 10 year bonds is like 25 basis points. Um, and even in the middle of the, you know, the mid to late nineties when, you know, as the matrix points out, it was the peak of American civilization as, as some people like to think and things are great. Even in the middle to late 90s during that period, term premiums were 100 basis points to 200 basis points. So, and never mind in the 80s and, and periods of greater stress. So, um, I think we're so used to complacency in bond markets. We're so used to those term premiums being negative that we're looking at this small change and saying, oh my God, there's really starting to be panic out there. We're a long way from that, which isn't to say that the fundamentals aren't moving in that direction, but I think you have to take that time horizon. Like, like you often say geopolitically, these are the good years. These are the, these are the Belle Epoque years before you get into the real nastiness. Um, and I think that's what the consensus is missing is we have a long way to go before we really see fireworks. Yeah, I'll play the devil's advocate here. And I think the the part about this that is, well, actually, before I play the devil's advocate, I like, I do have the sense that, as you said, when these guys go on and, and talk their book in these interviews, 
they're older, they're successful. Um, they have embraced conservatism with a small C that comes with once you have acquired a bunch of wealth, conserving it and thinking in that sort of way. I doubt when they were young guns, like fresh out of the, you know, fresh out of school or wherever they were coming from and they were trying to make a name for themselves that they were talking about this sort of stuff. And I'm sure that the people who were successful then were talking about this kind of stuff. Look at like, you know, Pierpot Morgan versus JP Morgan versus what, you know, JP Morgan is today. So I think there is something in that too, that, that those are the people that get to, to say that, but the real opportunity is underneath the surface, even if maybe at the top it's, it's a little uncomfortable, but the devil's advocate pushback would be, um, and I'm stealing from his argument here is if you extrapolate, you know, us government expenses going forward and you look at our political situation, it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or you vote for Biden or for Trump, both of them have massively increased government spending, uh, seem unwilling to raise taxes in any meaningful way and don't want to cut entitlements. So if you're going to continue to spend $800 billion a year on defense and you're not going to cut any entitlements and you're going to keep tax rates relatively low relative to most of the rest of the world, like that number is just going to keep getting bigger and bigger over time. And there seems to be no candidate, no political party that is willing to say, hey, if we do this for the next five to 10 years, like we're going to have a problem. That's not even part of the discourse. So does that concern you at all? Do you feel like that could, I mean, maybe that's accounting for the do doom and gloom narrative and maybe your response will be, all right, like when it becomes, when the fireworks come, like we will figure it out. That's usually how the U.S. works. We're impeccably bad at planning for problems. Problems arise and then we deal with them in a crisis moment and then we move forward. But how do you respond to that sort of political pushback to the rosier picture that you're painting? I think the key word that you just used was extrapolate. That's the problem is you're taking a linear view and saying, well, if you continue along this linear path, then that's where you eventually end up. And that's not a framework that's going to work because there's cause and effect. And we have a political system that responds to incentives, even if it's too little, too late. Um, but if you look at historical periods of hyperinflation, they've almost always been associated with some sort of significant societal trauma. Um, from an economic standpoint, they uh, usually are associated with major supply constraints or supply destruction, like literally factories being blown up, um, people being killed in wars, like, you know, being unable to produce things. Um, I would take the fact that there's no obvious will to change any entitlements or to cut the defense budget or even to streamline the defense budget um, <laughs> as a sign that how early we are, because there's, there's not even enough of an incentive out there for the political class to respond. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we have, we had the first little surge of inflation in living memory and we passed the Inflation Reduction Act, and that was the you know signature. I mean, of course, it wasn't designed to fight inflation, but the point being, right. you know, a little flash in the pan, and people start to panic. Like, what if you really start to have significant problems? Um, I guess that's what I would say is, like, we don't know what volatility looks like because it's been so long. We're so complacent, and 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 you can't take that linear approach from today to very far from today without taking that into account, if that makes sense. It does. And not to pick on him too much. I, I mentioned that he talked about geopolitics in his first sentence, but he kind of skated over it because he was like, oh, yeah, but the market has gotten used to geopolitical instability. And I was like, my man, like, no, that's the that's not the right conclusion. The right conclusion is I need to be listening to Jacob's podcast all the time because geopolitics is going to fuck up my shit all the time anyway. So if Paul Tudor Jones is listening, pardon my French and you should pay more attention to geopolitics, Paul, seriously, uh, New Orleans guy. Um, anything else you want to say about the bond market before we move on? No, let's let's hit the global stage here because there's a lot going on, I suppose. Well, I think the next one to hit with is um, usually China is crowding out is the is the the elephant in the room that is crowding out um, a lot of the other headlines. And it's funny we had we had some data in August that Chinese maybe maybe green shoots in the economy, maybe you know services going up a little bit, like consumer prices go. It looked like maybe there was going to be a reprieve. Uh, nope, that all stopped in its tracks. Uh, September's data doesn't look particularly good. Um, and there's a lot of other sort of things happening in the in the property developers market, um, local government debt, which is a drum that we have been banging here since the beginning of the year. Um, 
you know, China Beige Book, which is a great resource for those who who, um, who are out there, are also anecdotally showing that things are not going so well. So why don't we check in on on China and where Xi Jinping is out on his treadmill and uh, what the incline level is and how fast the treadmill is going? Well, this is a good example because often we talk about the importance of what do you pay attention to. And this is a great week for that because everyone is paying t- attention to uh, what's happening in Israel and, and uh, the Gaza Strip. And um, in the meantime, there's been some very interesting developments in China and very worrying developments. Um, so I, I will pat us our, on the back here in, in part because we were here a little over a year from now when we did that podcast on the Chinese property market and said, hey, the consensus is really underestimating how important and how huge this problem is. And since then, um, and, and, and just to, you know, put concrete stuff around that, we have been out of Chinese equities and our strategies, our global strategies for clients, um, which are supposed to sort of be benchmarked and, and outperform a passive international index. Well, China is by far the biggest component of any passive international index. Um, and it's it's been a terrible place to have any money for the last year. Uh, and thankfully, our clients have benefited from not being in there um, and being in a place like Japan, which now everyone loves. I've seen so many articles in the last week about Japan and how it's the, the place to be and Warren Buffett, the guru strikes again. Um, well, it's... I mean, we joked about that when all that, re- it really was like Buffett decided to buy Japanese companies and then everybody and their mom, like it really, it's almost skewing the data so much that I don't even know what to think. Anyway, but go on. Anyway, we wanted to talk about China, but, um, but yeah, uh, that, that's just kind of to self-congratulate us on, you know, how these things actually matter as far as dollars and cents go. Um, but where are we now? So the consensus on China has been very bad. Um, I still think that people underestimate the scale and the importance of this property market uh, issue. It is the biggest issue in the world, full stop, um, from an economic, a market, a structural long-term standpoint. Um, But that said, the sentiment toward China is really bad, and some things in the last week or two um, have emerged to really suggest that that's accelerating. Um, And that's two data points, I think, of particular interest. The first is um, we're sort of having a, a final uh, reckoning with the uh, the property developers. So Evergrande, Country Garden, they're essentially you know acknowledging the scale of their bad debts um, and and acknowledging their defaults. Now the issue here is not so much their bond exposure; the issue is their payables. So just accounts payable not to financial investors and, and mutual funds and people like that, but to providers of construction materials and construction subcontractors and people in China who are you know running real businesses and doing real things. Evergrande itself has $82 billion in payables just to construction materials companies is the number that I saw. That's extraordinary. Um, so some of these issues and they will be worked out you know there's liquidity that you can throw at these things um these are liquidity issues and uh the china has shown that there's no lack of will to uh, to smooth liquidity issues over but that's really coming to a head um the other uh, data point was there was a piece i think it was in the south china morning post uh, pointing out that local governments especially in the north of China, which has been hit particularly hard uh, from a macro standpoint, that they're borrowing money in order to recapitalize local banks. Um, and that is a that is a very interesting and worrying development um, because it shows a that they're acknowledging the scale of of the problem and that they're running out of liquidity. Um, if they need to recapitalize them, it means that they need that liquidity. Um, and, and B, the fact that local governments are taking out additional debt, you know, to rob Peter to pay Paul essentially suggests that there's a growing problem there. So this isn't to say that there's any financial crisis. I don't think there's going to be a financial crisis in the way that we think about it, but it shows, as Walter Baggett said, the scale of uh, wealth that was destroyed in the boom 
you know, the crisis just reveals how much of that has already poof gone away. And now we're having a bit of a poof moment and it's, uh, it's not good as far as directionally how China goes. Well, and it's it's especially not good for the for the arguments about the commodity super cycle that have been so prevalent in the last couple of years. Because talking about extrapolating, I think that was a case of extrapolating all this demand for you know, renewable energy and all the mineral commodities that you're going to need. Plus, of course, China is going to continue to consume at this level. And you know, the dirty little secret is that China consumed at this level and really, in some ways, floated the global economy by building these ghost cities in the middle of nowhere and taking the commodities to build them. Like the the rest of the world enjoyed. Um, you know, benefits from that too. Now that China's trying to say, well, we can't do that anymore and these companies are bankrupt and things like that, suddenly the, the demand for some of these commodities is going to go down, I think. But um, I wanted to ask you, uh, the, the South China Morning Post, or, I mean, you know, we do this stuff for a living. Can, can you like, for, for in a layman's terms, describe what it means when a local government is borrowing to recapitalize a local bank? Like, what does that mean in practice? Because there's a lot of jargon just in that sentence and I know that there's a lot in there. So let's just like, maybe in clearer English for somebody who's not focused on markets, explain exactly what that means. So I'll try to explain it as simply as possible. Um, the capital is essentially the equity on a bank's balance sheet that's available to absorb losses. Um, and in the end, it doesn't matter that much. Um, capital is there to basically be an accounting entity. If a bank takes a big loss and it doesn't have enough equity to absorb the loss, then the bank is sitting in a, in a, in a, it, it's insolvent. It's liabilities are greater than its assets. In other words, that doesn't necessarily mean that the bank's going to, going to go bankrupt. Banks go bankrupt because they run out of liquidity, not because they're insolvent. So when I say it's interesting that they're borrowing money to recapitalize the banks to basically put equity into their own local banks. Um, it might suggest that not that they're so concerned about solvency, which is a balance sheet issue, that they're concerned about liquidity and giving them additional liquidity, which is a, um, which is a, a cash flow issue. I know I'm, I'm, I'm falling into lingo despite myself, but it's a very complex <laughs> subject to explain in oh, very simple terms. Don't worry, I'm going to beat the lingo out of you. I thought capital on the balance sheet, according to the SBF theory of management, was that it, that's that's money that you use to gamble on, you know, on cryptocurrency. Is that's not why the banks have capital in the market? Anyway, I cannot get enough SBF, but we don't have to go down that rabbit hole. Well, but, SBF I mean, SBF went know. under because he ran out of liquidity, not because he was insolvent. Well, yeah, I was, I was, so Michael Lewis like wrote a book about SBF and I was, I was watching one of the interviews, another New Orleanian, apparently, apparently New Orleans just rules the world. Um, and it was funny. He, he had this line that I thought was very strange. He was like, yeah, if, if, if they hadn't had a run on the bank, basically, uh, or if they hadn't had a run on the exchange, like probably FTX would have been fine. They probably would have paid back all the liabilities and nobody would have known and they would have kept minting money. And I wanted to be like, but but like they were taking anyway it was just like a weird justification of the like no like it it was still a ponzi scheme michael like maybe it wasn't a madoff ponzi scheme but it was still fraudulent and eventually the casino was going to blow anyway um but to, to go back to the to beating the lingo out of you okay but so he, here's another part of it that that maybe we need to talk about in plain english so it's local governments borrowing to recapital local banks who would who do you borrow from if not the local bank so who's the bank that you borrow from if you're trying to stand up kind of the local is is that they're going to like the Chinese the People's Bank of China and so eventually all these local banks are just going to be on the People's Bank of China's balance sheet and then one day we're going to go poof and it's all going to be one bank like how, how do you fit that into the equation well i don't know specifically who is buying these local government bonds that are then being you know taking the money and in turn giving it to the banks but i would assume that it's you know the shadow banking system which is these essentially local government financing vehicles, they call them, which are special entities that get set up and they borrow money uh, through wealth management products. So ultimately, um, the people who buy the wealth management products are ordinary Chinese households and they get marketed to them as, hey, we're going to pay you eight, nine percent. There's very low risk. You know, ultimately, the People's Bank of China is going to stand behind everything. This is a great deal. Um, and that has been the biggest source of, of uh, capital or, or borrowing within the, the financial system in China. So 
that's the thing to remember is all of this bullshit at the end of the day, all the lingo, all of the, you know, complex financial mumbo jumbo. It's, it's ordinary people who have their wealth confiscated to pay for all this. Like that's the bottom line. Like that's how it goes. It's how it always has gone. Wealth is not just numbers on a paper and accounting entities. It's real stuff in the real world. And the people who have it are the ones who get screwed when wealth gets destroyed through bad lending and bad investments. Um, so those are the people, you know, ultimately standing on the other end of this. Um, but yeah, that's the mechanism so, through which they usually finance these things. Well, so it is kind of the SPF school of money management. All right. Well, here's another like simplistic, like uh, not simplistic, but let, the geopolitics guy is taking advantage of the markets guy and asking him tough questions. What What is to stop China from using its massive pile of foreign exchange reserves and just hitting the reset button on the entire thing, like wiping out the liabilities? Like they have like what? I forget like what their current account surplus is, but it's in the trillions of dollars. Like is the problem beyond the ability of the Chinese government to take a trillion and just like put the bandaid on and debt jubilee and we go from there? Like why, to tell me why that's a stupid idea and that I haven't, I haven't done enough <laughs> reading on economics. <laughs> it's not a stupid idea, but those aren't just like assets sitting in a bank account. That's not their kitty of U.S. treasuries. Um, for every U.S. treasury asset that they have, they have a, a yuan liability on the other side of it. So that's not, um, that's not like the savings account of the PBOC and it's just, oh, well, should I dip into the savings to bail everyone out? Like it doesn't work that way. Um, there's two sides of the ledger. Um, now, which that isn't to say that China can't use uh, those treasuries to support the renminbi, that they can do. That's function of foreign reserves. And originally that's why, you know, China... And a lot of countries like it, following the Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s, started accumulating such enormous reserves because, I mean, it started out that they were worried that they were going to see a sudden stop and a, and a drop in their currencies, which is what happened in Asia in the, in the late 90s. So yeah, it protects you against unwanted currency depreciation or unwanted currency risk, um, but it doesn't change the underlying reality of wealth destruction and who's paying the bill like there's that's not wealth that can be tapped to pay for these losses if that makes sense it does make sense and i wonder uh, on our on our investment research chat this week you were you were actually talking about gold and i wonder if that has something to do here too because the people's bank of china has been loading up the dump truck for gold they added what uh, 23 tons in july alone they were the largest buyer of gold in the world from a national perspective there um do you, do you think that has anything to do kind of with what we're talking about? Because you're talking about foreign exchange reserves as protection against these things. And I don't know, that that's that just stuck out to me as kind of interesting in that context too. So let's talk about gold a little bit because this is something I've been thinking about um, and we should go down this path. I think the everyone, when they talk about gold, because it's easier to think in this way, thinks in terms of central banks um, and cites those numbers and, oh, Russia's doing this or China's doing this. Um, at the end of the day, I don't think that's going to make or break the gold market. Um, I think, you know, yes, at the margin, central banks are buying some more gold. Ultimately, they can't hold too large a proportion of their foreign currency reserves in gold because, um, you know, there's a very strong preference for U.S. treasuries or for U.S. denominated liquid assets. That's the biggest, by far, most liquid and deepest market in the world to park your foreign exchange. Um, like, I just don't think the central bank thing is that big a deal. The big deal, I think, which is harder to measure and harder to, um, to really get the pulse of, uh, is individuals with wealth who are putting their money in gold. So take the China example. And, and I, I think, you know, this is something that everyone talks about and I don't want to start like a weird cuckoo gold bug discussion here because that doesn't do anybody any good. And you can get that on plenty of other podcasts. Um, but it's worth thinking about this sort of analytically in, in the sense of like, where are we in the environment right now? And one of the things that's pretty clear, even as we look around us, we talk about, you know, the U.S. defense budget and um, 
and uh, you know fears of fiscal prodigality um you go into cycles of overspending and then wealth confiscation um and wealth confiscation can have a lot of different forms it can be you know stealth monetization of the debt it can be just outright raising taxes on stuff so um for example like after world war one like what happened to the english country house it stopped being a thing in many ways because the taxes on real estate in england went through the roof and all of these you know i mean i know you're a uh you're, I always forget the name of the show every time we talk about. I was gonna, I was gonna <laughs> say you've been wa- you've been watching too much Downton Abbey. That that's what you've well, been doing exactly. in your spare you've, time. You remember on the Downton Abbey when they had to downsize and all the servants left? Like that is a story about taxation and about fiscal prodigality. Well, I, I, I mean, we had one listener actually write a comment on Apple on the podcast saying, I want Jacob's views on Downton Abbey. Let's just say that before it got to that point in Downton Abbey, I got so pissed off that I stopped watching. But the first couple of seasons, really, really good. Anyway, keep going. So you missed, you missed the sad part at the end when the world went into the 20s and then, you know, but... That, yeah. Rob, that, that's bit, my, my life's mission is trying to miss the sad part. That, that's what I'm trying <laughs> to do here in general. Yeah. Well, um, I think globally, you know, we're, we're sort of seeing a bit of the sad part or we likely will in many ways, because that's the natural outcome of these cycles. And that's what we saw back then. And in whatever form that takes and in different countries, it's going to take different forms. Um, but someone has to pay the bill for bad debt and wealth destruction. So, um, that I think is a very interesting trend. And um, especially if you, it's a self-fulfilling one because as people begin to worry more, then, you know, they start to look for ways to protect their wealth from being confiscated. Um, And gold, I think, is a very attractive asset in that uh, environment. Um, Land is very tricky. Land can be seized. I mean, if you know anything about history, like... It, the whole history of Western Europe is people getting their land seized and given to other people, uh, you know, in various yep. forms. So uh, having something that's movable, something that is uh, relatively liquid, and, and also, you know, as a, as a side effect, there are in, increased um, reporting requirements globally now. So, like, everyone has this vision of you know, the Swiss secret bank account, like that doesn't exist anymore. That, that's been totally stomped out, you know, in the last 15 years through FATCA and all of these, um, uh, all of these new regulations that have been put in place. Uh, it's not like the Wolf of Wall Street days when people would just roll in with suitcases full of cash. And those are the, those, those days are long gone. Um, but uh, the one exception to a lot of the new r- rules that have been in place is people who own property or people who own gold that doesn't throw off any income. Um, in many jurisdictions, you don't have to uh, you don't have to disclose the um, the ownership of those assets, um, or at least not to the same extent as you do you know if you own cash or or something else. So. So there's sort of structural advantages or structural reasons why people who have wealth who are concerned about getting the wealth taken away by governments might increasingly turn to gold as an option. Yeah. Um, I, I, th- there's a Bob Menendez joke in here somewhere, but for the second time on the podcast this week, I can't quite find the joke itself, but you know, Bob Menendez had some gold bars in his home, I guess, be, uh, precisely because it was untrackable. And it's funny also to think about how people talk about gold and, and things like cryptocurrency doing the same thing. Whereas like the thing about gold is it isn't really trackable, whereas cryptocurrency is eminently trackable, um, which has always seemed like a bit of a discrepancy to me, but I mean, working back from that and sort of getting back to the China point, I think it's also a good segue to talk about um, kind of emerging market economies in general. So, I mean, the reason that I'm here in Boston, we're recording on Wednesday, October 11th, so a day early than normal, and this will go out on Friday at our normal time. But I'm here to talk to a group of um, 
Chilean executives and talk about how geopolitics is affecting Chile and um, and what strategies companies should use to get through these geopolitical risks and opportunities. And maybe if there's some Chilean government officials there, um, they'll they'll learn some things from it as well. But um, the reason I bring it up is because we were also talking before we hit the record button that China has given a blueprint for success that really no other country can follow that because of China's success over the last 30 years, everybody wants to be the next China. And even, you know, some of the things that are actually examples of the problems, the structural problems in China's economy have become things that people want. People want the current account surplus. So they want the massive, um, uh, batch of exchange reserves. And, um, you know, Chile is a country, I think when you start looking at, um, well, they've had a current account deficit. They had a brief, actually, month of, of surplus here recently, which I'm going to have to dig into a little bit. But, you know, mostly a current account deficit. Um, investment, like, relative to GDP is relatively high, and foreign direct investment has been has been increasing. So, like, Chile has a lot of the the fundamentals that we look for in a country. And I'm, I'm going to talk to this audience and say, like, yes, you have all these problems, but look at your geography and look at your energy security and look at your food security and look at all these other good things that are happening to you. Now look at the fact that you trade only with the United States and China and you really need to broaden and diversify your base if you don't want to get screwed. Um, but this is a way of setting you up for, I know that there was an article in the FT about Turkey this week um, that really got you going. So maybe maybe use that to segue into to Turkey in general. Turkey, another country, by the way, loves their gold um, and has a lot of gold in the foreign exchange reserve. So it's not a perfect segue, but it's pretty good. Um, get on your soapbox about Turkey. <laughs> Follow my soapbox. People don't want to hear that. Um, yeah, so this FT piece really got my goat. And um, I think the issue is that we've been so blinded by China's success as far as, you know, thinking that that is the blueprint for every emerging market economy. Um, and aside from, from the FT, there was a piece incidentally on Brazil in The Economist last week that was just like the orthodox, oh, they're prematurely deindustrializing. They don't manufacture enough. Like just why can't they be more like China was essentially the thing. And as you know, Brazil is just going from strength to strength. So the fact that the uh, economist is writing these sort of whiny, um, you know, complaints just, uh, I think, totally misses the point. But on the Turkey thing, and this is relevant because Turkey is so central to everything going on in so many ways right now, um, the gist of this FT article was a very orthodox one. And it, and it's funny how moralistic we are in these, uh, in these ways because, you know, the article was essentially saying, well they've been running the economy into the ground with these crazy or unorthodox policies. And after the election, they got, you know, held to account. But how long will, they'll, will, will their come to Jesus moment really last? And will he lapse and start cutting interest rates again? And, and so on and so forth. And um, I started saying before that I think we're really blinded by the Chinese experience. And what I mean by that is Turkey looks in many ways like what a successful emerging and fast growing catch up economy should look like. They have a big current account deficit. They've always had a big current account deficit. That is what you want to see in a successful developing country. It means that capital from richer places is going into this place that has less capital and it's investing in the country. Um, so for ex like, uh, like you have to remember the current account is the opposite of the investment account. So if you're getting more investment in from the outside, by definition, you have a current account deficit. Um, so Turkey is very orthodox in that way. We're just so used to thinking of China as, as the orthodox thing, but China is really the very weird outlier. And if you were to look historically at other developing countries that were successful, they look more like Turkey and less like China. So that's mm. one point I would make. Um, and if you look at Turkey, um, the the FT is talking about, oh, the inflation is so high and uh, and debt that, you know, they've gone on a, quote, borrowing binge to support these unsustainable, unorthodox policies. And, and the data just doesn't support that at all. Um, so the currency has been going down. That's that's like the escape valve of the Turkish model. Um, the, the Turkish currency has been going down for literally 220 years. Like since the Napoleonic Wars, it's been successfully just 
lower, 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 lower. Oh, we'll peg it to gold for a while. Now it's lower. We'll peg it to the dollar. Now it's lower. Like that's just how that system works. And in the interim, Turkey's gone from being an extremely poor backward place to a middle income and growing nation. Um, if you were to look at their uh, their share of global GDP, for example, it's doubled in the last 20 years. So th their market share of the world has doubled, which is pretty extraordinary for a place that's supposedly such a basket case, right? Um, so, so what else would you expect to see if this was this crazy, you know, binge of of debt fueled extravaganza? Uh, uh, you would expect to see debt levels be very high relative to GDP. They're not government debt is in the 30% range, which is super low relative to even other emerging economies. And private debt is 180 something percent, which sounds like a lot, um, but that's very much on the low side of, uh, of the global scene. So Turkey, I see here 184%, Germany is 181%, Australia, 180%, uh, Spain, 190%. So if you're sandwiched between Germany and Spain, then you're not a basket case banana republic, um, I think it's fair to say. Um, and the last point I would make is just, if you look at you know Turkey, the debt is not going up, which shows you that the investment that they're making through the current account deficit is productive investment, is resulting in GDP growth. And you can see that because the investment percentage of GDP is super high. It's in the 30% range, which if you take away China, which is in the mid 40s, and that's just a crazy outlier for reasons we've discussed in the past, um, that's very much at the high end of of the range uh, within that that group of countries. So, I don't think you could look at any of the actual data on Turkey or just do a thumb to the wind check over a 20 or 30 year period and say that they've been anything but a huge success. Um, despite inflation, which has been consistently volatile and every 10 years or so goes into the 20s or 30s. Uh, so anyway, that's my soapbox. I think people really misunderstand not just Turkey, but uh, emerging uh, nations in general. And, and they, you know, misunderstand it for moralistic, you know, sort of reasons. And also because China has made us think in a very weird way of what a successful emerging country should look like. Well, first of all, I invite those people to continue mi to misunderstanding it because that's good for our business in general. And second, if you are interested in international investing, not just buying ETFs from BlackRock that are, you know, 30% one stock that doesn't have anything to do with the country, you know where to find us. Uh, shameless plug right there. The, the one thing I would say is, you know, in, in the mid 2010s, Turkey did have a problem with debt. It wasn't that the overall percentages were that big, but a lot of it was dollar denominated. And as you said, as the Turkish lira started going down, it wasn't the debt levels were necessarily increasing in absolute terms, but because it, because the debt was denominated in dollars and the Turkish currency was going down, that was what led to that first initial collapse of the Turkish currency in 2018 and the Argentine peso went with it and a couple other currencies around the world. And they stabilized things and then we went through periods of um, you know, the Turkish currency is getting weaker and weaker. And this was the time where everybody thought Erdogan was, was crazy. And we were here saying, no, what he's trying to do on the fly, and it could blow up in his face, but what he's trying to do is get away from some of this dollar denominated debt and get it in liras. And that's why he's backstopping so much of this with the lira and trying to get people and companies to put more of their assets into Turkish lira rather than to US dollars. And it hasn't been perfect. And it's, they haven't solved the, the issue entirely, but they've made significant progress since 2018 in doing that and with the Turkish government pushing for that. The other thing, and I said this to you, was the thing that Turkey has in the background too, is that, and and maybe Erdogan knew this, so this is why he felt comfortable you know, dwindling the foreign exchange reserves down and doing what he did to defend the currency and keeping up quote unquote unorthodox monetary policies for as long as he did, was the Gulf came in and bailed him out. The UAE bailed him out and the Saudis bailed him out. And he, he seems to have enough political goodwill that he can call up the Gulf and say when he needs the money, like the money is there and it's okay. Whereas like if you're, I mean, Argentina is sort of its own separate question, but nobody's going to come to Argentina's aid anymore because they're not willing to do it. Like the Gulf is willing to pony up for Turkey, probably for geopolitical reasons more than anything else. So, but that's still good policy. If you know that you have that in your back pocket, why not use it? And why not reduce your US dollar denominated debt um, exposure there too? So I wouldn't say Erdogan is crazy and that definitely could have blown up in his face 
but it didn't. And I think the the point that you're making here is that the story on Turkey, it's the story of 2018. It's not the, oh, he he pulled it off. <laughs> like he's he actually got through the other side and he's still the leader of the country. And now Turkey is going through a growth cycle with um, policymakers who are just as orthodox and who, who genuflect at the altar of the economists themselves, probably. They probably see them in all the meetings. Like those are the people running the Turkish economy now. So um, I take your point there too. Any Anything else you want to say on Turkey before we hit our last topic? Well, just on the on the injections that they've received or the liquidity that they've received from the Gulf, I think it gets back to uh, what we talked about with China before, which is that's not wealth that they need. That's not capital that Turkey needs. Turkey's not insolvent. Turkey needed dollar denominated currency to defend the lira. So those are different things. And like I said, that's sort of the escape valve of the Turkish system is like the lira kind of has to always go down, but you can't have it go down too fast or too recklessly because that causes volatility and social problems and stuff like that. And I think you mentioned Argentina, that's a wonderful comparison. Because if you look historically, like Argentina um, has similar problems with currency, obviously. Um, and they have been a country that's run, you know, kind of swung between deficits and, and, and current account surpluses. But if you were to look at just their current account, you would say, oh, well, they're not they're better than Turkey, if you were, you know, thought of it in those ways. And Argentina has gone absolutely nowhere for, I mean, a hundred, it depends on how far back you want to go, um, at least a hundred years. So though, like on the surface, you would say, oh, Argentina and Turkey, high inflation, current account deficits, blah, blah, blah. those are two completely different scenarios, completely different economies. And one is sort of firing on on all pistons in some ways, and the other one is just a basket case or a dumpster fire, as I think is the metaphor you prefer usually for Argentina. Oh, it's it's the technical term, not the metaphor. That's actually what it is. Is that in the it's IMF a, report? No, I, 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 I you know, Sh Chicago Manual of Monetary Policy or something like that. That's a really, really niche joke that I made just there. Um, Let's close with some thoughts on energy. For, for the second time this year, I, I ventured to say publicly that I wasn't sure that oil prices were going to go up in response to a big external event. So earlier this year, it was the, Sa the initial Saudi cuts to oil production. I said, I... I don't know, that looks weak to me. And I got a lot of pushback on that. Um, and we weren't confident enough to put capital to work there, by the way, it was just part of our macro view. But I said, I don't know, if, if you put a gun to my head and I had to make a call here, I think I'd be on the bearish side. Um, and then when, when you know, the Israel-Hamas war breaks out last week again, people, and we, we talked about oil prices last week, how it looked like they were marching to 100 and then came right, right back down to 80, 82. You got a 4 to 5% spike in that first day of trading after the war, after markets opened again. We're recording on Wednesday, so maybe by the time this publishes, I'm going to look bad, but oil down 2.5% today. We're now around 83, getting closer to 82 and where we were before the war started. Now, you know, we had Kamran on earlier this week where we talked about Iran and Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and all the regional um, uh, regional possibilities for a broader conflagration. And I'm, I'm not sounding the all clear by any means, but I'm just pointing out, you know, we have the worst violence between Israelis and Palestinians since 1948 and concerns about is Iran involved? Is, is, is this going to affect, um, you know, oil prices in general and oil production? And oil, three, four days into the war, is shrugging its shoulders. Um, so there's that. There's also, there's a lot of interesting developments around natural gas. Um, you've probably seen ExxonMobil uh, poning up to buy Pioneer Energy um, at an 18% premium, one of the biggest shale, I think, it, I think they are the biggest shale producer. I don't know, they're, I shouldn't, one of the biggest shale producers. I can't be wrong if I say one of, nice little way to squeeze around that. Um, you have France and Germany where Macron and Scholz had a meeting. Uh, by the way, if you go to Politico, the, the picture that they had of the meeting was Scholz and Macron and his wife like stuffing sandwiches into their mouths. Uh, I don't know if Politico is saying something there, if they just want them to look bad, but um, I don't know. I wouldn't want somebody showing a picture of me stuffing a sandwich into my mouth in a story about how I can't agree with um, you know, my most important neighbor about energy policy. Um, the issue here is that France wants nuclear to be part of the EU's clean energy future, and Germany doesn't because Germany is worried that any subsidies that go to nuclear is going to get away from wind and solar and maybe hydrogen also, which is the things that they care about. So there's that. Um, and then also, um, 
you know, a pipeline plus telecoms cable sabotage in Finland and Estonia, where we don't have a ton of details there. We can speculate maybe a little if you want. But um, all of that conspiring to, you know, for a third consecutive month, natural gas trying to break out from its current range. And we have been very bullish natural gas for the last couple of months. Um, but I know that you also want to go uh, go at some of the supply numbers and maybe you want to pick apart any of those other developments. But I thought we would just check in on on energy generally because um, you know, for a second consecutive week, th things not operating quite the way markets are expecting. There's a lot to go into there. Um, let's start with oil. Um, from a trading perspective, and, and we don't have any position here, just to be clear, um, one of the adages of trading is when there's fundamental news that should be really good for something and the price doesn't really respond, that's pretty bearish and you should be worried if you own that asset. And I think that definitely applies in this case. Um, oil markets definitely don't appear to be pricing in um, some scenario of greater conflagration. Um, the other thing to, to note just on oil is, you know, I, I know you mentioned in your um, solo podcast, which was excellent, how comparisons to 1973 are just so off the mark and you really shouldn't compare this to anything. Um, among other things, just from a purely oil market standpoint, one of the key themes back at that time has been totally flipped around. Because if you remember, like OPEC emerged during that period. That was a period where US was losing energy sovereignty, where emerging markets, where the Middle East was emerging and taking over the oil assets and seizing that power for themselves and starting to hold the US and other Western countries over a barrel, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> this is the opposite case. You just saw Exxon just bought Pioneer the amount of sort of latent capacity in the U.S. is huge. Um, and the situation is completely reversed. We are independent um, of, of Middle Eastern oil. Uh, in fact, I just, saw a, um, I just saw a piece run across the Bloomberg screen just for a little anecdote. Uh, one of these little, you know, brief headline things that said, you know, Saudi uh, tried to increase oil prices to refiners in Europe. And as a result, they bought less from Saudi and bought more from other sources <laughs> yeah. uh, in the last you know month or whatever. So, um, so yeah, I don't think that those comparisons are are, are particularly apt. And and I am, um, you know, just reiterating that uh, it's that's not a good thing for oil if you get a Israel uh, Palestine war and it sort of shrugs. Um, the the France Germany nuclear and green thing. I mean, there's a whole, that's a whole topic uh, in itself. Um, I'm not sure where exactly to start there other than, I mean, maybe you can tell us you've, you've just done your deep dive on Germany. What do you make of this sort of, I don't want to use the word intransigence, but it's kind of intransigence by the, by the Germans who don't seem to be in a particularly strong position. Does this sort of show that how weak the uh, the, the the German um, the German government, the German alliance is between the Greens and the FDP and and the center left, where they have to kind of kowtow to the anti-nuclear parts of that group? Or um, what do you, what do you make of that, just from a German uh, standpoint politically? Yeah, and I, and I, I forgot. Or, or we're probably publishing the Germany thing next next week, if not this week. Or did we already publish it? Did I did I miss it in the? I emailed it out to all the clients, but I didn't post it on the. I I, I forgot on the platform yet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you forgot. <laughs> well, there's the reminder. Yeah. Um. But you know, we we had you know we we had um, we had a podcast about sort of Germany's uh, e economic future with a guy who was very, very bearish about Germany economically. My my take in the end after doing the research, and you'll have to sign up for the Knowledge Platform if you want the full report, um, was much more nuanced and really can't be, there's no sort of one sentence takeaway. It was, yeah, for some sectors really bad, for some sectors not so bad. But the one thing I kept coming back to was that you know German politics right now, like, Germany needs to make some really hard policy decisions, and this German government 
is not going to be the one that makes the hard policy decisions. They don't have the imagination to do it. They have hemorrhaged so much support in the polls that they don't have the credibility to do it. And it's this unholy coalition between the Greens and the FDP and the and the um, and Olaf Scholz party, like uh, the SDP. Like they're they're not on the same page ideologically either. So it's not going to be this sort of thing like the Hearts reforms in 05 and 06, where they go after the welfare state and they start streamlining things and they make some tough decisions and suddenly Germany is off to the races. It's more like the Schroeder government, which ironically was the one that wanted to push through the phase out for nuclear. Um, so for me, it's, I, I don't want to go after Scholz. It's a difficult job being the leader of any country. And I don't want to just take pot shots at him. Like I know how it's an incredibly difficult position that he's in. And especially with the lack of support that he has in a government that, that was, um, you know, the so-called traffic light coalition. Um, but you know, Germany bet wrong. They bet on Russian natural gas. Russia invaded Ukraine. They're moving away from it. They also decided in the late 90s, early 2000s, and they weren't the only European country to do this. Italy was in there too. A couple others who got freaked out about nuclear energy. And I get that reflexively, but I don't know why policymakers would allow themselves to go there because it's clean and safe. But whatever, that was the decision that they made. It's it's a democracy. It's their country. They could decide what they want to do with their energy mix. But they made bad bets. And now this idea that no, 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 no. Like, d don't do nuclear. Like, we, we need the subsidy that are going to help our energy situation when you were the ones that made the bad bets, um, it really comes off tinny to me because this is the same country that when the Eurozone had its sovereign debt crisis was lecturing the Greeks and the Italians and the and the Portuguese and the Spanish about all their irresponsible debts. The, the Italian budget deficit thing is already now coming back because they want to spend four or five percent budget deficit of gdp next year and that's technically against the eu rules but then at the same time you know germany is expecting everybody to go along with them because they and their energy situation they are screwed i mean the next year or two is going to be really really unpleasant from a german energy situation and if you got a cold winter or let's say you did get a regional conflict in the middle east that becomes a larger thing and energy prices really do go to the moon like germany is going to take it really really badly um so i I'm, I don't know how to account for that tone deafness. It's obvious what France wants. Like France has bet big on nuclear and they want nuclear to be part of the solution. And that makes sense. I don't know why if your goal is clean energy and energy sovereignty, you're taking energy technologies off the table. If anything, you want to add more and more technologies to the table. Um, so the best explanation I have is just that this German government doesn't have much imagination and doesn't have popular support behind it. And the sooner that Germany has a new and stronger government, the sooner it can get to the really hard things that it's going to need to do um, from an energy policy perspective. And I just don't think it's this government. You can see that also in some of the regional state elections that they had over the past week. I mean, the conservatives are resurgent and the AFD is also resurgent too. So cue all the, you know, right-wing German Nazi pieces. They're, they're dusting all those off and just updating the date and posting them on the FT and other places as well. So, um, Ultimately, the, the sort of key takeaway, I think, Germany and France have to be on the same page if anything's going to happen with the EU. And I am, you know, we've talked about how I've, I've become a little bit more pessimistic about the EU. And I, I'm sort of looking towards France and Macron for leadership because France is indicating, yeah, we're talking about major reforms and we're going to show off this major new platform for changing Europe a little bit come January, February. You know, nothing is the last gasp. There's always, you can always change things. But I, I find myself really looking towards that moment and seeing whether France can push this through because I, I don't think leadership and imagination is coming from Germany right now. It's going to have to, ha it's going to have to come from somewhere else. And just by default, just by lack of options, it's either going to come from Paris or nothing's going to happen. It seems to cut against this narrative that Germany is in this crisis situation, you know, the deindustrialization narrative, because tying this back to, to what we were saying about the U.S. before and hyperinflation and, oh, are the wheels coming off? And if you could extrapolate literally, then, you know, in 20 years, we were all dead. Um, I would expect if Germany really were in a crisis that they would be willing to sacrifice, you know, principles and sacrifice sort of the fear of losing industrial capacity to France in order to get, you know, guaranteed cheaper nuclear energy because that seems to be what the hang-up is and and it was funny if you read the article i don't know if you saw i forget who it was i think it was elizabeth born or someone said like really have like can you name one german company that has relocated to france like, who you know france has a lot of benefits but you don't want to start a factory here <laughs> but um anyway my point is 
you know, when you are in a real crisis, that's when you have crisis response. You have a sort of political response to a price incentive, to a market incentive to do something more drastic. And the fact that they're kind of diddling around and worrying about solar versus nuclear subsidies and, you know, that somehow BMW is going to open up a factory in, in, in France and, and not in Germany uh, shows it can't be all that bad there. Well, in some ways, in some ways, the worst, I mean, this is tongue in cheek a little bit, but in some ways, the, the worst thing that happened to Europe last year was that it was like one of the warmest winters in recorded history, because, you know, Germany in particular, all these governments were ready for the crisis. And then because of the extremely warm weather, and because people didn't count natural gas supply as well as we did, you know, they were prepared for this terrible crisis, and it didn't happen. And then when you get people all amped up for a crisis, and nothing happens, well, then people assume, oh, well, then it's not going to be that big of a deal. Like, we got through it. Everything's going to be fine. And I think it's that way, too. Um, not to get too far into this. Uh, I mean, this is a hornet's nest that I'm approaching right now. I think COVID, in some ways, was the same thing. People got all spun up, like lockdowns. Oh, my God, we're all going to die. This could be the Spanish flu, things like that. And it was really bad. Like, it was like, what? I forget what the exact mortality rate, but it was significantly worse than the common cold and things like that. But it wasn't the Spanish flu. And it probably didn't warrant shutting down the economies for multiple years. That's not what lockdowns were supposed to do anyway. It was supposed to give breathing room so that you could staff the hospitals so that when the waves come through, like anyway, not, not to go down the route, but I, I'm just saying there's a psychological aspect there where when you expect a crisis and then the crisis doesn't come, like the you get a sense of complacency and the government that was saying, oh my God, this is the crisis, I think also um, loses a little bit of credibility. So, I mean... Again, like I, I think the key takeaway here is that Germany is in a very difficult position. This government is not going to lead it to the future. And in terms of deindustrialization, it's a myth. And it's a myth, like myths are not wholly untrue. Usually myths have a kernel of truth at them or they have some kind of lesson or something that you're supposed to learn from them. And that is a little bit true. Like some German companies are lowering production or looking at factories in China or moving factories to Eastern Europe where things are cheaper. It's also probably why Germany is looking at Ukraine and salivating and things like that. But the idea that German industry is just going to leave entirely, like that's a myth. Like that's not actually happening. You know, it's, you know, energy prices plus this plus that is putting pressure on it. It's going to be less and maybe the supply chains go here. But like I said, it's, that's not a sexy headline. That's what, well, now we have to like read the data and actually, you know, get into depth. That's not the, the one, the one sentence headline, Germany deindustrializing. Like that's, that there's a disconnect there between those things. So I'm actually quite bearish about Germany over the next year or two. I'm a little more optimistic that, you know, Germany has reached moments of crisis before. And usually when it reaches moments of crisis, Germany is one of the rare countries in the world that has enough social discipline to be up to task, to deal with the crisis. They've done it, you know, two times since World War II, and maybe they'll do it a third time. I would sort of put my money there. But in the short term, yeah, like from an energy situation, Germany is screwed. Their political situation is not good. And I think you're seeing that in, in, in the Scholes and Macron meeting in general. Well, it's the, it's the darkest before the dawn theory of macro cycles, which is, you know, as you say, the really hard and, and uh, difficult policy changes only happen when there's a sense of crisis. And you need to find these countries where they do have the social cohesion and the political mechanisms that can actually respond to these things and not just spiral from crisis into worse crisis, that they can fix them. And, and the U.S. is like that, and Germany is like that. Um, so, you know, as you say, short-term negative, long-term, you know, pretty good. Long, I mean, long-term opportunity, because if the multipolarity and nearshoring and reshoring, if all of that is true, then the countries and companies that still have expertise in making things in living memory... Like they're the only ones that can give you autonomy and the ability to produce these things. Maybe it'll be more expensive. Maybe they're going to need subsidies. Maybe they're going to need support and things like that. But like, you know, the U the U S has lost way more jobs and way more technical know-how than Germany has. Germany, yes, has you know, I think manufacturing as a share of GDP has gone down over the last 10 or 15 years. It's still much higher than the rest of uh, the OECD. I'm pretty sure I, I have that figure right. So yeah, it's, it's just a more complicated take. Um, even, even if in the short term things are not good. Um, anything else on, uh, we, we talked about the Finland, Estonia pipeline thing. I, there's really not a ton of information out there about it. Um, I will just say, and I, I put this on the knowledge platform, the thing that stuck out to me there was it wasn't just a pipeline. It was also a subsea cable. 
Um, and people talk about, I, people, I talk about subsea cables. I have a lovely map of where subsea cables are in the world and how this could be a major tripwire if you had a regional war cutting the cables. It's why so much emphasis is going towards space and satellites. Can you make sure that communications um, for your military or for your government continue in case somebody does cut a subsea cable or somebody knocks out you know, regional networks and things like that? Um, and I think one of the reasons it hasn't happened yet is because it's sort of like a nuclear weapon, mutually assured destruction type phenomenon. If you start going after the cable, somebody's going to do it to you. And, you know, we, we live in a world where we can't live without the Internet. It's sort of like a like a fight club scenario type thing. But I did just want to flag it was it, it wasn't just the pipeline. It was the the subsea cable thing stuck out to me a little bit as something concerning. And we'll just have to see kind of what Finland and Estonia share after their investigation is done about who was behind it and why they did it. Because right now, I mean, we can speculate all we want, but there's really not a lot of info out there. Yeah, the, um, I guess all I would add to that is, you know, it's definitely worth watching because that would be a huge risk factor if people start targeting them. Um, and one of the choke points that I think is worth watching, uh, I mentioned to you, I, I read in the last week, there was a piece here pointing out um, in the media here in France how Marseille is the number one choke point for all cables coming into Europe. And I don't have it in front of me, but there was a wonderful map showing all of the cables coming from Asia, from uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa, and through the Middle East. Almost all of them are coming through Marseille, which thankfully is the most stable and, and secure uh, uh, city in, uh, in Europe. Um, but when you think about choke points and things to monitor, that's one that I would put on my, uh, I, would, I would put it as a three on the importance score uh, in, in knowledge platform terms, but definitely on the choke point lists to, to watch if people are going to start attacking these things. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's plenty enough of S. Anything else you want to say to the listeners before we sign off, Rob? I don't think so. Okay. Well... Go enjoy your Downton Abbey, and until next time. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. You can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor.